Hey everyone, Professor Wills here. So I wanted to pop on and uh, teach you a little bit about the art of post-minimalism. Um, this um, has a lot in common with some of the minimalist artists we've already met. Um, you might remember Frank Stella, Donald Judd, um, working in a kind of a reduced um, ingredient um, modality, um, even reduced shape or form and technique. Um, that's why it's called minimalism. Um, but what you find um, in the 1970s is we have artists um, who are continuing in that vein, but also um, exploring other um, goals. Um, and one offshoot of this post-minimalist era is an interest in process. Um, how working with a certain ingredients and techniques um, um, can uh, the experience itself be the work of art. Um, others also involved in process to um, conceptualize um, their artistic output, but also with um, um, more of a an agenda towards um, evoking a response from the viewer, um, sort of an interpretation, um, perhaps that's informed by the artist's own biography. So we're going to take a look at two female artists um, working um, in this way. Um, and without further ado, let's get to the PowerPoint. All right. So as I mentioned, post-minimalism, um, this is something we're turning a corner and getting into the decade of the 1970s. Um, and again, as I explained, working in the vein of minimalism, but also their art could be about process alone. And it's best to explain that by looking at the art. Our first artist um, is Eva Hesse. Um, this is called No Title from 1969-70. Um, and what we find here um, is that she is working with a limited um, ingredient list, um, including uh, liquid latex, um, rope, string, and wire. Uh, the work is called No Title. Uh, she is attracted to non-conventional materials, kind of the, uh, you know, hardware store um, ingredient list versus something you'd find in a more traditional art supply store. And she liked that she could manipulate with them. Um, these are more or less industrial materials, um, not unlike what we saw other minimalist artists um, but not the masculine kind you think of, like steel, aluminum, or plexiglass, when we think of the work of Donald Judd, for instance. Uh, Hesse liked to see the effects also of weight and gravity in her art. Uh, she felt that that informed her process. And so she's associated with this um, approach to art called process art. Um, and that was a very important uh, path for her to go on to create the work she created. For this work, she uh, tied knots in lengths of rope and then dipped the rope into liquid latex and then hung it to dry. She allowed the forms that you see there to emerge as it was hung, embracing the changes that would occur when the work was exhibited. There's no minimalist reduction to form or multiple forms. Here, we instead, we have a complex display of webs and tangles. And that display may change over time as perhaps the latex cracks, perhaps a knot untangles, and then the artwork morphs into some a completely different visual experience. To some, it may read like, uh, somewhat like human intestines, but others read it like Jackson Pollock's strip paintings in their expressiveness. Since it's not conceptual art, there isn't anything Hesse is trying to suggest to you or evoke as a concept. 
it's really all about making art and embracing the process to do so. Let's move on to our next artist. This is Magdalena Abakanowitz, called Bax from 1976 to 1980. Uh, ingredients include burlap and resin, and she creates works in mass. There are some 80 pieces to this sculptural project she embraced. Uh, Abakanowitz is from Poland and she's known as a fiber artist who used weaving to create large scale sculptural figural artworks. As the artist said, quote, it is from fiber that all living organisms are built. The tissues of plants and ourselves. Fabric is our covering and our attire. Made with our hands, it is a record of our souls, unquote. So fiber is an important concept here with these forms. It can represent the toughness of the human spirit. What she would do here is she creates a mold and each of the figures you see here um, on the left and right, which are identical, just displayed in different indoor or outdoor contexts, um, are forms, as the title indicates, representing mostly the presentation of human backs. There are no heads, um, not really any arms to speak of, and no legs. It's an emphasis on the human back. Um, just what it does, as you might have already picked up on, is it suggests body language. Some have interpreted that body language to represent something more meditative or contemplative. Um, others have interpreted it as a um, expression of the body language of resignation, of surrender. Um, it's interesting to think about the artist's background. She grew up during World War II in Poland. So not only did she live in a country that was severely abused and traumatized um, during the Second World War, but that was also a country that was part of the Eastern Bloc and um, had uh, Soviet control of that region where people were expected um, to behave a certain way. They were controlled. The population was controlled in mass. Um, and so that kind of thing is something you see in her work, this idea of, you know, what that um, communal trauma must have been like. But keep in mind also the medium she's using, and this is where process plays a role. She's embracing fiber um, and in each figure, each sculptural figure has this quality of fiber. And as the quote indicates, it uh, can be a source of strength. And perhaps a takeaway from her work is the uh, enduring human spirit and resilience of the people of Poland um, and perhaps of others around the world as well. Coming up, let's take a look at how other artists um, move in the direction of um, the uh, natural world and we'll examine both earthworks and land art. Thanks for joining me.